for word to the second edition, why am I giving this audiobook away for free? At the end of 2012, I finished this book. It was meant to take the world by storm and make me rich. In April of 2013, while preparing the book for its debut, I went insane, raving and lunatic, pants crapping insane. After a weekend in jail and a 10 day stay locked inside a mental health facility, which it should be noted fixed my problem, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and my plans for the book began to circle the toilet bowl. I didn't know it would actually go down, I thought it was too big, or too important, or that some cosmic force would stop it and make things right. But bipolar disorder, I denied it at first, but now there can be no doubt, does more than sabotage the best laid plans of mice and men, it can destroy them. So now, at the very start of 2018, I cast my book to the digital wind, after years of denying it existed and blaming the mystery force, who, truth be told, did absolutely nothing. And that was part of the problem, I supposed, I throw it back at the public that barely had a chance to reject it honestly, as though it sucked. I don't think it sucks. Revisiting it years later, I find it still contains the spark of what I thought I saw when I thought I saw a spark of something new. It's a free photo, intensive ebook now, I'm swallowing what tiny pride I had. A molehill into a mountain and then back into a molehill, and overturning my hat on the sidewalk to take what can still be had from it. I'm begging, begging anyone to read it and begging those who like it to donate whatever they wish to donate. See hard sell at the end of the book. Having literally collected pennies from the gutter, seriously, I did that, and still pick up every penny I see. No donation is too small, honestly, a quarter or a single dollar isn't about to be rejected. The fact is, it is a viable publishing strategy, and the only one left me, bipolar is a mood disorder and not, as most people seem to assume, or a personality disorder. People with the disease can be touchy, no doubt about it. But if your mood swung as wildly as a rocking ship right at an amusement park and you couldn't control it or at least slow it down, I submit that you would be a tad touchy too. It doesn't make us necessarily bad people. I should note that unlike when I wrote the book, I now have health insurance, and I've found medications that seem to work for me. A process that can take some bipolar sufferers years. Once I seriously began investigating the effects of various medications, and admitted to myself that I had a problem and the problem was a real, physical one and not just an interminable series of bad days punctuated by occasional ecstatic ones. The process of finding the right combination of medications took me about two years. My panic attacks while on the road now make sense, and I've got anxiety medications to deal with such problems when they arise, though they tend to make me sleep too much. At times, rereading the book now after five years of holding the book in the deepest of deep freezes, it feels at times as if someone else wrote it, in a very real way, I suppose someone did, can any of us truthfully claim that 5 years of being alive doesn't change us, at least a little, were I to write the book now, I would inevitably do things a bit differently, for one thing, I'm a better writer, as significantly for the book, a product of mental activity, my bloodstream now courses with powerful antidepressants and antipsychotics. That's bound to have an impact. I wonder how much time is spent writing diary entries than is spent reading them. My guess is that the former is far more popular than the latter. The writing of this book, 
being sucked into a project that for several months dominated my life, seems like a bigger effort than what is here, and time having passed, it is as if all that is left are the artifacts of who I once was. Maybe this is why we are less likely to read what we've written in a diary than to write a new entry. It is uncomfortable to be reminded that we've changed, and it is life affirming to make a new mark, even if we don't have anything especially profound to say about it. Presented here then, at absolutely no cost or restrictions on how it may be used, see Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike Licensing which now covers use of this audiobook, I offer of what required years to write and a few days to destroy, an attempt to squeeze any loose pennies out of the bottom of it, it isn't a crap book, I still find it well written, and rather admire the photographs, now seeming as if someone else had taken them, it is my attempt at maximalist surrealist writing and photography, See you when it's over. Introduction I grew up in rural Indiana. This is relevant only as a way of beginning a story, an ultimate starting line. The state and the region don't show up much in this book except, again, as an origin. A little over four years ago I felt myself slipping. I was renting a big, empty house in the foothills of Tucson, Arizona, from which I had started my own computer consulting business and was scraping by financially, which seems now to have been a minor miracle. I'm a good programmer, but owning one's own business requires much more than just being good at something. It requires skills that I have now concluded that I never really had at all, or at least the prerequisites for them, like avarice. What began as a mild itch became a festering, gnawing suspicion that I had taken a wrong turn somewhere and that I had compounded the problem by trying to go faster down that wrong trail, as if it would eventually lead me to the right one. My life had become one of working ever harder to make money to afford things I had only ever used to solve my own dissatisfaction in the first place, self-medication via credit card and that a familiar story, something had to change. I put all of my belongings into a storage locker in Tucson, they are still there, and bought a used fifth wheel trailer. I pored over maps and traced hypothetical lines with a finger. Then day one arrived, and I jumped off the cliff I had been contemplating, a come what will, need to see something, anything, before I myself dissolved to nothing. I would follow whims and potential fortunes, the great recession having decimated my pathetic business as it had so many others. People I would see living in vans and redeeming food stamps and grocery store checkout lines throughout the nation, until I found what I was seeking, whatever thought was. There is a ubiquitous notion built into the American character, one that is certain that by running away from a situation it will change in one's absence, or that one will find something he never suspected that will permanently alter his life's circumstances, or that the promise of the American dream, despite its having been battered to incomprehensibility by its deus ex appearances in so many films and television shows and itself, consciously ironic overuse by generations of postmodernist cynics and pessimists, might actually be more than a dream, might actually be possible, that all that might be required is the guts to roll onto an unknown road and vanish into it, besides, I was running from nothing, I was only running two things, it seems to me now. I took my three cats with me, Sid, Torgo, and Steve F-180 so named because he came from a breeder of lab animals, 
who had stamped his ear with a tattoo bearing that designation. They collectively deserve distinguished medals and ribbons of valor. The highest plaudits afforded by the road, a golden fast food wrapper or a certified platinum coffee cup lid glued to a plaque of some sort. They, and my four truck, for that matter, are unspoken heroes in this book, like Edgar Allan Poe's Whiskey or Hunter S. Thompson's Peyote or Kurt Vonnegut's Will to Live, my cats chill me out, and thank heaven for little miracles. Traveling with cats may make me an oddity, if never an absolute rarity, but I submit that cats are perfect traveling companions assuming the traveler himself is otherwise sound. Cats are aesthetically pleasing and clean, necessities in such cramped quarters, they sleep all day and most of the night, are fun to play with, and defecate in a box in a corner a procedure that seldom involves me touching warm feces, a definite plus in my book. If there is a single indivisible unit of this book, it is in the attempted depiction through words and images of places, above all else, I try to render them sensually, the way they feel as spots of ground on which to stand, or sit, or lie. The most succinctly defined physical space a person can occupy, relationships between any two places are fairly irrelevant in such contexts, although a meager attempt is sometimes made in the chapter introductions, in other words, I am less interested in relating how I got there than what is to be found there, whatever it may be, the emphasis is on place. A map of my journey isn't needed but if one were attempted it would be drawn rather sloppily in broad strokes from the north coast to the south coast, overlapping slightly on either side by a bit of the neighboring states. The narrative in such a roughly defined north to south route, but the events are largely out of order, rendering any attempts at literary cartography worthless anyway. All of the traveling described in this book involved a sort of routine, but one that changed from day to day and week to week, the destinations, all of which involved going from one state park or county park or national forest to another, selected solely on my wish to see what this or that place on a map actually looked like, what photo opportunities might be found and then solely on my wish to return to them, to re-experience these places again and again, like listening to a favorite album, because these are all public places, this meant that I was constantly living in public among strangers, which is hard to do, I am a fairly shy person, not abysmally so, but chronically, like a thing seen so often in oneself that it must belong to his being, like a foot, I am fine with my shyness, I don't suppose it makes me some kind of faulty person, but shyness combines with loneliness too well for me to be entirely comfortable with it, I am often the only long term resident in any given campground, aside from the hosts, not only are these places like small cities in the summer time, they are cities that change somewhat from day to day and change completely from weekend to weekend, all residents moving out to be replaced by new ones, the constant turnover like life in a hotel but with less privacy, comfort, and convenience, new makeshift cities rise when the old ones fall, recurrent exoduses and genesis each day at checkout time. I capitalize, hyphenate, and compound and concatenate words and phrases at will, I do this not to be cute, but for effect, I also take liberty with the expression of numbers, my theory is that people are asked too often to consider numbers in their numerical forms, often when paying bills or obeying traffic laws, so, screw numbers, how do you feel now? 
I've played with the page numbering for the same reason, it doesn't matter, don't worry about it. United States Highway 101 is expressed as numerals because it is my muse, my mother road, and because 101 looks stupid and 101 sounds stupid, years aren't spelled out for a number of reasons, the most salient being that a year is a unit of measure actually worthy of numeralized nomenclature, a lot can happen in a year. Years expressed as numbers often seem to have their own emotional gravity, a force strong enough that the events themselves don't even have to be mentioned. 1492, 1776, and 1980 for our cases in point. I see a camera as a tool of exploration, like a compass or a good walking stick. It gives me a valid reason to go where I otherwise wouldn't. How useful is that? My camera lets me try to catch what I see and pull it out and show it to everyone. My little moment on a beach or in a forest or atop a sand dune transformed into a physical artifact. After it has been shredded to digits inside the camera, reassembled as digits in yet another plastic electronic box and finally spat onto paper, nothing but synthetic ink on tree flesh in the end. The basic concept is simplicity itself, here is a moment that happened to me, at this point it becomes an expression and as such it is no longer a moment frozen in isolation but the first line of a conversation, the photos in this book that are like road sins semi-autonomous one-way bits of information intended to precisely pinpoint a location, you and I are always right here together, sharing this exact moment, the language of road signs can sometimes be ineloquent and weird, for present purposes it is enough that they point the way, as for stylization or anything aspiring to truth in my photos, I claim only the things which only I can claim, the truth and the style, however humble, thus always being my own, that is, I claim the right to stylize only because it is mine to claim, the photos here have been culled from over 100,000 that accumulated over the course of for years, captured on digital cameras of various capabilities and stuck on a hard drive to await this moment. Many of the shots included here are the results of attempts to learn. Sloppy, undeniably, but I think there is value in the odd snips and off cuts. I don't believe that technical ability is all, even nothing is something. Many inspirations have ancient roots. Nature and time were dominant themes for Roman and Greek poets and philosophers, as they are for me. Ancient historians frequently embedded personal scientific observations into their accounts, and those of their travels most particularly. One senses a bit of gloating. Clement of Alexandria, working at the dawn of the 3rd century, attempted with his work Strymides meaning patchwork, to create a book that could be enjoyed like a stroll through a meadow, where ideas grow wild and are free to be plucked or ignored as the reader wishes. This book aspires to be like an ocean. For similar reasons, some modern scholars make very esoteric points of their life's work. The generalist is always going to trample over subtleties, plough under the battlefields whose battles are sacred to the specialist, reduced to one line as entire schools of thought. Specialists of all sorts should approach this book semi-warily. This is not a guidebook, it is a work of creative non-fiction, meaning that the facts are true, but the narrative relies on literary techniques similar to those used in fiction. Some specific place names are suppressed, to encourage those interested to find them on their own, and prevent everyone else from getting bored. 
I want to give tourists a book that instructs them on a version of the Oregon Coast story that lies beyond hotels and restaurants and highway waysides. The real value to be found lies off the beaten path and requires wandering and wet pant legs to reach. I want to give locals a snapshot of themselves as seen by an outsider, reversing the usual dynamic like a love letter written by a roving anti-tourist. But the real physical space is literally abstracted, too, such that these should feel like places based on real places for those unfamiliar with them, those alive now or someday to be alive, because time is an abstracted concept in this book, too, for what it might be worth in the long run. The slight coherent narrative that does exist roughly describes a meandering path that took place over the course of three years or so, it took me a year of full-time travel before I even made it here, the story otherwise roams freely within these constraints, and habitually outside of them, with little regard for formality, we will swing pendulously through space and time. It will be fun, so here is the result of four years effort, the photos captured and prose written and wholly on the road, in the beginning, I'm an ancient spore washed up on an alien coast, by the end, I'm a pot bound ball of roots. J.B. Eldham, Manzanita, December 2012 Camping at the edge of American history, the Oregon coast in words and photographs, by J. B. Elham. For Haiti. Prologue, Edge of a Continent. I can go no further without a boat, a tourist shouts into a cell phone, he has left his rental car at the parking area, where a jetty made of black boulders and dumped into the sea years ago begins its quarter mile reach into the raging waves, and gone for a stroll, as have I. I overhear him because he is shouting into his phone, to make himself heard over the thunderous, Gut rattling roar, he is reporting to the folks back home on his journey, or else he has never considered that there might be a natural boundary in his way at any point in the great expanse of the American West, or, for all I know, he is on a trip around the world and has forgotten his map, but I don't think so, he is laughing, I suspect the first of these possibilities is the closest to the truth. He wanted to see where the great road went, although it is impossible to know without asking which particular road he followed to get here, or where his starting point was, so he followed it until he could go no further. It is a story as old as the nation itself, the knowledge, even just the suspicion, that there is so much more to the continent to be explored has driven Americans and others to this point if not this particular point, than to one like it, from time immemorial, this is where human habitation of the Americas first began thousands of years ago, as those seeking greener pastures and fatter game crossed a temporary land bridge from Asia, it is the boundary of the continent, but not a border, the land simply ends in the nothingness of the ocean, but then, the Pacific Ocean is not a nothingness, but merely the place where the land is subsumed by water. The man turns away and I can no longer hear what he is shouting into his phone. He prowls the jetty as he talks, restless like me, a stiff gale coats us both with sea spray while brown pelicans navigate circles down the jetty and back out to sea, to return to shore. 
lifting themselves periodically over the crest of the wave to plunge into the churning wake behind it, to come up with a fish to be gulped down, and down the jetty again to start the cycle over. I ponder his comment about the boat, having crossed the continent myself a time or two, it is not a subject I have not considered before. What would it be like to weigh anchor and sail to Asia, or back to Alaska where the American story began? It is idle speculation. I don't yet have the means to actually make it happen, but as the man turns back toward me so that his words to the people back home are again carried to me by the wind, my idle speculation seems less so. Thus arrives the denouement. Maybe I can rent one, the man says, and I can tell he's only partly joking. The West Coast is the most manifest of the many manifest destinies in play for those who have opted to start over, a psychological extension and logical end point of the nation, with their apologies to Alaska and Hawaii and all the other colonies of the original thirteen. I feel like I have been here before, but it is true only in my imagination, not in physical space. I had planned to drive to the coast on an earlier cross-country solo trip, an earlier attempt to find a home, and I have a memory, too, of making the choice not to come here. I made the final decision while stalled in traffic in downtown Portland in a pounding rain. Had I turned left, it would have extended my trip and pushed what was already the extreme apogee of my trip a little further to the west, right to the edge. But I was tired, depressed by the dreary late autumn weather, and just wanted to go home. I turned right and vanished into a fog-smothered Columbia River Gorge, to begin the long trip back east. I would eventually settle in Tucson. Arizona, a city that had earlier charmed me more than any other on the same trip. This all happened 15 years ago. That left turn I didn't take, that missed connection, is what haunts me. Had I come here the first time, would I have moved here? How would my life have been different? What have I missed? Which faces in this crowd are those of friends, or even enemies? That I have failed to find all these years, mysteries abound, these pages are haunted. Travelers gather at the margins of the land and stare at the sea like it were a finish line of a sort, it is the place to watch the end of the race, where the sun goes down on the day, every day, at last. People don't really pass through the Oregon coast unless they are going from one part of it to another. It is one of the few places in a nation of automobiles that can make that claim. One either lives here or is a visitor here, or, in my case, both. The first arrivers to these continents, having crossed the Bering Strait at the beginning of time, for all historical intents and purposes, had no idea what they we would find. Ahead of them they would only have seen the towering blue-white walls of glaciers, foreboding misty mountains, and vast sheets of ice-bound bulks and swamps. They had no idea that they had discovered not just one but two continents, in fact, a whole new world. They didn't know, but curiosity and hungry bellies must have driven them on like Captain Ahab gone out looking for a little fish. I first approached the Oregon coast by way of Astoria, my first glimpse of the ocean caught between semi-trailers and surfboards strapped to the tops of cars. From day one in Arizona I have spent about nine months completing a whaler-shaped loop that took me through my Midwest and childhood stomping ground and then through the deep south in winter time, Spanish moss on live oaks and barbecue and boiled pea, nuts galore, then the entire length of Texas, back through the southwest and into the northwest via Utah and Idaho. As I pull into my oceanside campground, 
The idea that I have been headed here the whole time hits me all at once, like an original idea. I begin already to hope that someday it will be my ultimate destination, but for now it is simply the next place on my list of places to visit while I am still traveling. Now that I am here my plans are vague, but I have done what I set out to do. I have completed a solo tour around the country by myself in my own private adventure pod, my cabin on wheels. I temporarily lived in state parks from coast to coast, rolling slowly to experience the places more thoroughly, and I'm rolling still, still rolling slowly. My cross-country travels have already had their effects on me, even if I don't know it yet. I'm already different, so I get out, take off my shoes and roll up my pant legs, and walk into the surf for the first time.